Welcome to Game Shack. You know, I've always wanted to make at least 12 episodes showing games that were never released outside of Japan. Kind of a weird number, but hey, here we are. Anyway, I think I've got some good ones for you this time, like this one playing on the TV in the background. You know what game that is? No? Well, you're about to get told! First up is Cyborg 009 for the Super Famicom by Interbeck. I think I pronounced that right. This is based on a manga or an anime which I'm not familiar with. So there are nine cyborgs and I'm guessing one of them is a baby cyborg or maybe the Professor Cyborg. At the start of each mission you choose three characters from a selection of eight cyborgs. At least I'm assuming they're cyborgs since they all have numbers like 004 or 009. You can switch between them at any time by tapping the L or the R button. They each have different abilities, although it might not really seem like it at first. For example, Cyborg 009 here shoots an electro gun. In fact, most of the cyborgs shoot this exact weapon. However, each character has their own special move as long as you have enough energy in the special gauge. Cyborg 009 can run really, really fast for a short time. Cyborg 004 can shoot a spread weapon which will crumble rocks. Cyborg 001 can float as well as fly with rocket boots. Some characters don't seem to have a special ability when you press the button, but that's because they're not in the correct environment. For instance, this blue guy can't really do much on land. However, you'll want to select him if you go underwater because he's the only one who won't slowly lose health, and everyone shares the same life bar as well as the same special meter. He can also float and swim underwater if you press either of the special buttons. Because of this, certain characters are often forced on you in a given stage just to make sure you have one cyborg who has the power to make it through. You can still choose the other two though, and I always like making sure I have number 004 and 001 on my team. Within each stage are icons to collect for experience as well as a few here and there that can refill your HP, special, or even both gauges. Each stage has three rounds plus a boss fight. After a boss fight, you can assign the experience points among your characters to help improve them, but you need to use the L and R buttons to switch between them, which is weird, honestly. But it's not a big deal. The control can feel a bit goofy at times, and often it feels like I'm not touching the enemy with my weapon. The first time I beat the second stage boss, my team was rounded up, exited the screen, and that's it, black screen. The game crashed. What the hell? I started over from scratch, and fortunately the game never crashed again, but that was pretty odd. The graphics aren't bad most of the time, but certainly aren't among the best you'll see on the Super Famicom. These moving diagonal shadows look weird, and I'm not really sure what they're supposed to represent. The music is pretty good, and I like the quality of the synthesizers used in most areas. Overall, this is a pretty fun, if quirky game that's above average and worth checking out. Since we're here, we might as well check out Cyborg 009 on the Mega CD, which of course is known as the Sega CD in North America. This version was developed by Riot and published by Telenet. It's still a side-scrolling platformer, but this time you only play as 009. I can't discern what's really going on with the story. You hit a girl that has bug eyes with your car and then nurse her back to health. Then she causes lots of trouble for you by trying to kill you, but eventually you win her over to your side, I think. Then some bad guy wants to add her to his collection of bug-eyed girls. Uh, that makes sense. Honestly, there's almost more time spent on cutscenes than there is on actual gameplay. And the gameplay feels super weird. It's very fast and twitchy. You shoot an electro weapon similar to the Super Famicom game, but I like this one better because it's fast and it goes across the entire screen. You also have a dash move called Cut the Foods, because that's what he yells each and every time he does it. You're briefly invincible when you do this, so you'll need to do it if you want to survive a lot of boss fights. You'll also need to cut the foods when jumping sometimes, as some jumps are way more tricky than you'd think. There's even a few self-scrolling stages that move super fast where you need to fight another character. You'll definitely need to use your cut the foods here. 
Seriously though, there's not a ton of gameplay here. It's here, it just feels like everything is really small and short. That's what she said. The graphics are fairly average for the system and take absolutely zero advantage of any of the Mega CD's special features. Well, except for the cutscenes, which are well animated. The sound itself could have used more work. For example, when you cut the foods, it's panned more to the right for some reason, no matter what side of the screen you're on. Same with your scream if you get hurt. Still, here's a platformer on the Mega CD, an actual game that has zero FMV. You can play it without knowledge of Japanese, and that goes for the Super Famicom version as well. Check it out if it looks interesting to you. Overall, I think I like the Super Famicom version a hair more. Just a hair. This is Chain Dive for the PlayStation 2 brought to you by Sony themselves in 2003. You play as a dude named Shark and it seems the world is being invaded by alien bugs and of course only you can save it all by yourself. I mean, this is a video game after all. And yes, that means you need to also rescue many helpless women who are randomly in distress throughout your exciting adventure. This game is entirely 2.5D and you can only wander back and forth up and down, but not in and out of any given location. This game is also very weird. You see, there are these green orbs that you need to latch onto in order to propel yourself. You do this with the R2 button. It's like Bionic Commando in a way. You can also double jump in order to get a bit more momentum going if you need it. Fortunately, these green orbs are conveniently scattered everywhere in midair that you might need them. Thanks, whoever put all these here. Overall, it's frustrating navigating each area by latching onto the green orbs. Fighting is also pretty weird. You have an ice sword and you can't just slice enemies to death like you want to. This game wants to be much more complicated than that because more complicated means more fun. Once you slice an enemy one, two, or three times, it turns into ice. Or maybe I need to dash into them while slicing to turn them into ice. I really haven't been able to figure this out because it's not very consistent. Anyway, once they are ice, you can latch onto them with the R2 as if they were a green orb. Do this and dash into them and break them apart and they die. If you're a loser and can't do this in time, your nefarious enemies will free themselves from their icy tomb just to resume attacking you. So don't be a loser. Instead, be perfect. Lastly, you have a mega powerful attack which freezes all nearby freezable objects. You then zip back and forth breaking them all. It's actually pretty cool. You have a gauge that limits the number of times you can do this and it refills as you kill enemies. The controls are hard to learn, hard to get used to, and even harder to master. But once you get at least somewhat used to them, the game does actually become enjoyable. You don't have to defeat all of the enemies to complete a mission, at least not most missions. Most levels have slightly different objectives. Like this one where you need to work your way up to the top of this spinny thing. It's harder than it looks, trust me, but I actually really enjoyed this level. Or this one where you need to find buttons all over the level. You need to stab them with your sweet blade to activate them, which can be kind of tough if alien bugs are attacking you. These light up the towers, and once they're all lit, you can go to the next place. Or this one where there's a bunch of helicopters slowly floating up in order to get outside of this dome. You need to keep them all alive as alien bugs keep attacking them. Fortunately, the game lets you save often, and you can retry as many times as you want if you fail. I'll be honest, I died a lot, and each time I did, I wanted to retry because I felt that I could figure it out if I just gave it one more go. The graphics are pretty bland most of the time. I say most of the time because sometimes they're even more bland. The good news though is that everything moves fast and runs at 60 frames per second, or fields per second since it's interlaced. The music is quite enjoyable. The rest of the game kind of feels like a budget title, but the music sounds like something you might hear in a more polished release for sure. Still, this game has a lot of potential here that sadly wasn't quite realized. It's still worth a play though as it's certainly interesting. You know, I've always been interested in this next one, and it almost got an international release, but no. 
It's by the same people who brought us hit games like Outrun, Afterburner, Sword of Vermilion, and Shenmue. I actually had to illegally burn a DVD just to show you guys this game. That's right, I'm risking jail time for you. Here's Rent a Hero number one for the original Xbox, released only in Japan in late 2003. This is based on the Dreamcast version, which was also only ever released in Japan. That version was a remake of the Mega Drive title Rent a Hero, which, you guessed it, was only ever released in Japan. Believe it or not, the Xbox version was being readied for a North American release, hence the English text you see here in this leaked version that I'm playing. Anyway, in the beginning, you order a pizza, and instead they deliver some combat armor to you. Eh, happens all the time. You test the suit by beating up your dad who's dressed up as a dollar store Godzilla. After this, you decide to become a hero for hire, hence the title of Rent-A-Hero. You have a neighborhood that you run around in, and as the game progresses, you're able to visit more places. You'll have to memorize where everything is because there's no map to be found anywhere here at all. One of the first things you need to do is hand out a bunch of flyers. This is pretty boring, honestly, just like GameSack. There's plenty of stuff like this that has been added to the game to make it feel longer than the original. Eventually, you'll get more interesting missions to partake in, like making deliveries. Or transferring some money to a bank. Don't worry though, because you'll eventually get to deal with things like an exciting bank robbery. You can check for new jobs using your sweet Sega Creamcast at home to see what exciting opportunities are waiting for a hero like yourself. You're also able to save your game here. You'll get into some fights, and they're pretty easy to figure out what to do. Granted, it's certainly no Virtua Fighter. Sometimes the controls feel weird here and there, and it can be difficult to pull off a move. You automatically face the enemy that's closest to you, or whoever the game thinks is closest. You can fight with or without your suit, but obviously you're going to be way more powerful if you wear it. Eventually, the battles become random as you run around instead of simply being prompted by the story like they are early on in the game. Still, the battles are usually quite winnable despite the lack of polish. There's lots of places to wander in and out of, and it's always fun exploring inside a few of the buildings. There's often some cool places to find hidden out of the way in a corner. And sometimes you just gotta sit down, relax, and let it all out. Hey, why did it flush? I wasn't done. There isn't even anything in here to read. <laughs> Oops. One thing to keep in mind is that you need batteries to power your suit and it doesn't take long for them to run out. Not only that, but you need to deposit money into the bank in order to keep your suit. Speaking of batteries, some women in this game really, and I mean really, like talking about batteries. I just can't fathom why. The quest itself honestly isn't as exciting as it could be. I mean, I don't mind doing mundane things, but it's often not clear what the hell you're supposed to even do. For example, you're told to patrol the streets in a certain area. Okay, so you go do that. You get into tons and tons and tons of random battles, but there's no indication of any progression in the game at all. It turns out that you actually need to go inside of the bank to fight the bank robbers that I mentioned earlier. Nobody ever tells you to check out the bank. You're just told to patrol the streets. Perhaps this is one of the things that would have been fixed with the translation had it gotten an actual North American release. As far as the controls go, they're pretty stiff. There are no analog controls at all, even when you're just walking around. This makes wandering around more frustrating than it needs to be. Moreover, you have absolutely no control over your camera. It takes care of itself and it does so at its own pace. And that pace is slow. Graphically, you can tell this was a Dreamcast game at one point. It certainly doesn't push the limits of the Xbox in any way. This game uses the same engine as Sega's Spike Out games. Comparing it to the Dreamcast version, they look pretty similar. Yeah, I know the Dreamcast looks a little sharper here, but that's because I have the sweet DC HDMI and the Xbox was captured using the FrameMeister, which doesn't like 480p very much for some reason. And yes, this one runs in 480p. Everything also runs at 60 frames per second. As far as sound goes, there's a few arranged versions of the tunes that were in the Mega Drive game, but honestly, they get old pretty fast. There's also lots of ambient sound like traffic noise, even though you don't see any traffic at all. Not exactly what I would describe as an amazing audio experience, but not bad enough to make your skin crawl or anything. Overall, the game isn't bad, but I really wish it were more exciting. Still, it's quite weird that it never saw release outside of Japan. Uh, 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 uh. 
This is Metal Stoker for the PC Engine from FACE, released in 1991. There are tons upon tons of PC Engine games that were only ever released in Japan, but it can be kind of hard to find one that's not an RPG or a spaceship shooter. So how about a multi-directional tank shooter instead? This one is fairly cool. It's basically a poor man's Granada. And in case you didn't know, Granada was a game on the Genesis and Sharp X68000. Anyway, in this one, you move around in eight directions and you can shoot in all of them by pressing the two button. If you press the one button, it locks you in whatever direction you're currently facing in order to strafe. You then press that button again to unlock yourself. Sounds pretty simple, but I found it kind of tough to get used to. You sometimes forget if you're locked or unlocked until you start to move again. Certainly sounds like an easy thing to remember, but trust me, you'll get mixed up in the heat of the action. I would have preferred it if you held down button one to strafe and it fired while you were doing it, but they didn't ask me. Other than that, the control feels pretty good and that's literally all there is to it. You can pick up lots of different weapons. Some are pretty good, like this one, which also fires behind you. Others are bad, like these mines that you lay. Or this tiny little shield thing, which is your only offensive weapon at this part. Usually, once you destroy enough of a certain thing, the exit will open up and you're prompted to proceed to it. Many areas introduce interesting traps, like this room, which will only let you proceed a certain way. You can't see where you can or can't go until you run into a barrier, which stops you from moving. Each site is pretty big, often with several different areas to work your way through. And of course, there's a boss fight to top it all off before going to the next site. You can take a couple of hits which will stun you, but the third hit will end your little tank life. You have three lives and also three continues. Good luck, because this game can eat up your lives really fast if you're not careful. The graphics are pretty good, with some really nice use of color all around. There's also quite a bit of variety between the different sites. The music and sound aren't bad either. There are some voices that can be difficult to understand, but I think this was intended since it's more of a robot voice. One voice prompts you to go to the exit by saying, go, go. And I think the other one is saying engine when you're down to your last hit before you die. Yeah, it sounds like engine to me. This is a fun little game that offers up quite a bit of challenge and it's no surprise that it didn't come out in North America for the TurboGrafx-16. I mean, very few things did. You know, I've always liked Transformers as a kid, and I kind of still do. And no, I'm not going to cover the Famicom version of the game, but instead one that I didn't even know existed until you guys told me about it. Now I'm glad I'm holding Dive Bomb here instead of Devastator. In case you didn't know, this entire scene is green screened, and Devastator is almost, well, entirely green. I wonder what that would look like. One way to find out. Here you go. Well, hmm. How about Transformers, released on the PlayStation 2 in 2003 from Takara and Winkysoft? <laughs> Winkysoft. Yes, there are three Transformers games released outside of Japan on the PS2, but none of them are this game. This one is based on the original Transformers, or G1 as they've become to be known. Since it's a Japanese game, some things are different, like the names. Optimus Prime is known as Convoy, for example. The good news is that you can set it all to English in the options screen. Then the names become what you expect them to be. Optimus Prime is still Optimus Prime. This is one weird action game. The cool thing is, is that you can play as either the Autobots or the Decepticons, though the story and gameplay remains largely the same between their campaigns. You start out being able to choose from three different members of whichever team you choose. You control one while the other two fight beside you. You can also choose formation, which seems entirely unnecessary as you all just wander around anywhere you want during a battle. However, you're trapped between invisible walls until you defeat all of the enemies in most cases. You have a basic punch and a basic kick, and that's what you'll be using most of the time. You can also press both buttons at the same time for a more powerful attack, but it uses energy. You can transform into your alt mode, and this has its own special attacks which can be useful. However, you can't stay transformed very long because the developers don't want you to have too much fun. Sometimes I'll transform only to automatically transform back into my robot mode again and again. What's more is you'll often get attacked from behind by tons of enemy clones and you can't really do much about it. 
you have to turn around before you can fight them, and that's far easier said than done. It's incredibly annoying. Occasionally, I'm able to do a leg sweep to get out of it, but it seems rare. You don't know how much I had to hunt for this footage of me doing it right here. You collect experience and energon, and you can use all this to power up your characters ever so slightly between the stages. There's almost as much story here as there is gameplay. Unfortunately, they didn't get any of the original voice actors, and some of the voices here are a far cry from the original. <laughs> you fell into our trap all too easily, Optimus Prime. That voice, it must be Megatron. Nah, I don't think that's Megatron. Anyway, everyone talks pretty slow, and honestly, it sounds poorly done compared to the cartoon. You'll have to face me now. Prepare to be hurt. Get out of my way, you old tin can. Right, this is it. At least they got the transforming sounds right, though. The music is generic, but it'll do, I guess. Graphically, it's a tad rough, but at least the characters look like they're supposed to, and I appreciate that. Still, I can see why this one wasn't released outside of Japan, as it really isn't that good of a game at all. While certainly not amazing, the game called Transformers from Melbourne House and Atari that we got internationally is infinitely better. This one is based on the Transformers Armada series, which I'm not familiar with at all. They seem to love ripping off lines from the G1 universe, though. I would have waited an eternity for this. It's over, Prime. That's because G1 is awesome. Also, Optimus Prime is here, or at least some form of him is. Anyway, this game is well designed for the most part. It's linear, but it still gives you the feeling of freedom. It even has a widescreen mode, which is cool. All that makes the Japanese-only game here feel so much worse in comparison. While I personally do prefer the G1 series, I've got to admit that this game here absolutely falls flat. Remember Shockman on the TurboGrafx-16 from Asaya and NCS? Of course you do. Well, unless you don't. It's basically a Mega Man look-alike that doesn't exactly play like Mega Man. Anyway, it was the second game in the Shubibidimin Man series. And I guarantee you I'm mispronouncing that, but that's okay. Life goes on. Everything doesn't have to be pronounced perfectly. Anyway, I'm just gonna call him Shubibidimin Man. The first game was only released in Japan on the PC Engine, and you use a sword instead of a rapid-fire arm cannon. It's much more simple looking, and it features stiff controls. But the game I want to talk about here is the third game, and it's called Kaizou Chojin's Shu Bibin Man 3. Just rolls off the tongue. Anyway, this one is for the PC Engine Duo, which means that it's a CD game. You once again have a sword, just like the first game, so it won't remind you of Mega Man at all. You can also hold the attack button down for a short time to release a moderately powerful ball of energy, which can be slightly controlled after you shoot it. Right away, I've got to say that the visuals here are hugely improved over the second game, which itself was much better looking than the first. There's plenty of parallax effects here, which will make you think the console has two independent background layers as it doesn't look like it was faked with sprites at all. They did a tremendously good job here. Gameplay-wise, it's pretty fun, if a bit easy. Just like the first two games, you can choose to play as either a dude or a dudette. Your life bar is located at the top of the screen, and each time you take damage, you get stunned for a second, which is annoying at first, but you get used to it soon enough. You only have one life, and if your energy runs out, well, it's game over. While you can continue, you do get set back pretty far. But you see all of these brown capsules that certain enemies are dropping? If you grab 100 of these, you'll be able to continue right where you die once without having to go back. There's also other kinds of capsules that you can collect which will refill your life or even extend your life bar. There's even a cool shooter stage similar to the second game, just not underwater. Despite how polished the visuals are, the game somehow feels a touch unfinished. I've encountered some glitches here and there, and the controls still seem slightly rough. For example, controlling your jumps can be pretty tough sometimes. Not that it matters much, because you'll blow through this game rather quickly. I've already mentioned how much I like the graphics, and the few cutscenes that are in here are well drawn and look good, though they don't animate much at all. The music is good enough, some of it's actually very well done. 
However, I wouldn't say that it's one of the best CD soundtracks on the console. At the same time though, it doesn't really need to be. It's a good game and it's the best one in the four game series. Wait, did I say four games? Why yes, there's also Shoe Bibbin Man Zero for the Super Famicom. This was released in 1997 on Nintendo's Sega Channel ripoff called Satellaview. Actually, it's not a ripoff. I only said that because I thought your keyboard looked a bit cold. Anyway, this one is still a 2D platformer, but you don't use your sword or an arm cannon. This time you use your fists because this is a more gritty, more real Shoe Bibbin Man. It's not, you just happen to be boxing your foes to death this time. You can still hold down the attack button for a charged attack that's useful sometimes. There's not a whole lot here that will remind you of the previous game, save for a couple of items that you can collect to restore your life and extend it or whatnot. Speaking of items, every enemy drops something so you'll be collecting things like Super Famicoms, Game Cassettes as they call them, and even Squirrels. The platforming here is pretty fun and it feels smooth, but honestly I got a tiny bit bored after a while. The graphics are good if a tad basic and the music is okay. It's an interesting game that most people didn't get to play. Developer Messiah lasted until 2014 when they were absorbed by a company called Extreme. They never bothered to make any more games in this series. Well, there you go, more games that were never released outside of Japan. You know, in 12 episodes of this, we've covered more than 80 games that were left in Japan. Certainly there are many, many more, but do you think any are still worth talking about? If so, let me know which ones, and in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSec. Look at me, I'm Devastator, G1 Devastator that is, and the best Transformers are the G1 Transformers. Only cool people prefer the G1 series. All the other non-G1 series are dumb and it should be illegal to like anything but G1 Transformers. Foo, foo, foo. Look at me, I'm a big ass Devastator and I'm definitely not G1, but I kick all sorts of ass. Hell, I'm way better than you are. What? No way. What series are you from? Hell, I don't know. I don't pay attention to that kind of crap. This guy here thought I looked cool, so he bought me. Hey guys, no breaking the fourth wall here. You argue amongst yourselves. Yeah, but you're still made to at least look kinda sorta like me, which means that G1 is the best and everyone who disagrees should be put in jail and stripped of all their rights. You're an idiot. I have way more points of articulation than anything in the G1 series could ever dream of. You look bad and you should feel bad. I think the big takeaway here is that I'm a grown man playing with Transformers, and I love it. I'm gonna get you. No, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> <laughs>